While you are enjoying the last bits of your um, delicious dessert and coffee, uh, we're going to start with a little introduction to Casey Moliere 400 in 2022, because that is the genesis, really, of, of this tonight's program. Uh, <coughs> our speaker I will introduce in a minute, but um, she and I are co-chair of the Higher Education Committee as, uh, as of one of many committees in this uh, enterprise. And if, if this is all new to you, you're about to be enlightened on what it's all about. So let's look at just a little bit of a, uh, lo let's look at a video explaining a little bit about what's Casey Moliere 400 in 20, 2022. It's Moliere's 400th birthday, and Kansas City is having a big celebration! <laughs> Casey Moliere, 400 in 2022. It's happening right now, with theater, dance, music, puppetry, visual arts, literary arts, including new translations of his plays, cuisine, and even a coloring book. We're talking about Moliere, the greatest writer of comedy in all of great French theater. Moliere was not only a great playwright, but he was himself a comic actor. I think audiences still love Moliere today because it's it's always relevant because it's human. It's about people. It's about the things that people are always dealing with and the kinds of people you're always encountering. Right. Hypocrites, hypochondriacs, flirts, lovers, jerks. <laughs> right, exactly. I found on reaching home that she was married. Married to whom? To him. To oh. him, you say? Yes. Him. There is a very strong French heritage in Kansas City, which is marked by historical markers, both in English and in French, around the city. The first Europeans who were in this region at the beginning of the 18th century were the French, the coureurs des bois, the fur hunters. And this city was founded officially by Francois Chouteau, and I think there is no better place in the United States to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the birth of Molière. We are throwing a huge party for Molière's 400th birthday at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. On va être ébloui, ravi, c'est formidable. I, I think what's so exciting about this festival is that it is, uh, it's a community effort. Yeah. Right? Uh, we're having professional theater companies, we're having universities. So then you see the lines and it doesn't rest until the very end. Art can transform us in so many different ways, internally and externally, and create a, create a community in that moment of laughter and joy and celebration. And if there's anything we need right now, it's, it's laughter and joy and celebration and community. Moliere, hope to see you there. <laughs> this has been a really exciting uh, project for me to have the privilege of working um, on, and I just wanted to give you a little uh, opportunity. If you're looking for a Christmas present for a grandchild, uh, we have coloring books and Felicia just happens to have some with her here tonight that have the character, a character from the play in costume and then a synopsis of the play on the other side of the page. And they're just terrific. So for a mere $10, is that right, Felicia? A mere $10, you can support the festival as well as uh, do your Christmas shopping. So. If you want to, um, Felicia's at this table right here, and you will recognize her from the video. Uh, and please feel free to, uh, to talk to her once this is over. We're very um, honored to have Michelle Leon with us tonight. 
uh, when we were first talking about events that could be connected with the the whole celebration, the whole two-year celebration, I thought, wow, why not have one of these what rich French resources that we have in the area uh, bring us a program for the annual dinner, and the board thought that was a good idea. So we are very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Michelle Lyon, professor of theater from KU. I'll tell you just a little bit about her. She's a theater scholar and director. She spe specializes in French theater in the context of national identity, cultural history, and performance practice. She's editor of A Cultural History of Theater in the Enlightenment, Bloomsbury Press, 2017, and her 2009 book, Moliere, The French Revolution and the Theatrical Act Afterlife, University of Iowa, received the Bernard Hewitt Award for Outstanding Research in Theater History. She has translated and directed several of Moliere's plays and directs in the European and American avant-garde tradition. Dr. Lyon received her PhD in theater arts from Cornell University and a DEA from the University of Paris. She taught at the American University of Paris from 1997 to 2001. Please welcome Michelle Lyon. Thank you, Jen, for that very gracious um, introduction. Great. Okay. Reputation, reputation, reputation. Oh, I have lost my reputation. I have lost the immortal part of myself. <clears throat> and what remains is Bestial, Cassio, Othello, Act Two, Scene Three. Reputations are indeed about immortality. They don't end with death. In fact, they thrive in posterity, taking on their most interesting attributes in the afterlife. Without reputation, we are, as Cassio says, like beasts, living in the moment without sense of self, with nothing to survive us without memory. Cassio's lines also remind us that reputations can be lost, gained, or otherwise reevaluated. Historians study the reputations of national figures because the way a society evaluates its national heroes reflects the changing societies of that, changing values of that society. The figures we choose to revere and the ones that fall into disfavor are a reflection of larger beliefs and concerns about what constitutes national character. What we recognize as cultural heritage is constructed through a continual process of valorizing and revalorizing, and as we are seeing in some cases today, devalorizing. In English, perhaps the best example of this is Shakespeare. While we might consider it unthinkable today that he would not be recognized as the greatest author in the English language, cultural historians have shown in a number of books with titles like Michael Dobson's The Making of a National Poet, how Shakespeare became Shakespeare. It was a process that took, give or take a few years, two centuries and involved an important shift in the sense of British national identity away from continental values. William Shakespeare, as one historian writes, is now as normatively constitutive of British national identity as the drinking of afternoon tea. To the members of the Emeritus College of UMKC and guests, thank you for inviting me to talk this evening. As a scholar and a stage director, I'm interested in the way that theater artists are valued in a national and international context. My talk this evening is about the history of Moliere's reputation and specifically how he inhabits that symbolic realm wherein a an individual artist becomes an icon of a nation's cultural identity, a national hero. 
Evidence that Molière merits such a designation is indisputable. He is acknowledged as the father of French comedy. He is venerated in France to an unparalleled degree. The French consider their language the language of Molière. His plays remain frequently performed and are refreshed with each new interpretation. School children memorize passages from his plays and public figures quote him. Annual events commemorate his birth and death. Over the centuries, he has become a subject of hundreds of plays and more recently films. Perhaps the only inconsistency in this sketch of national adoration is the fact that Moliere has not yet been given a tomb in the Pantheon. The monumental, mo I'm one ahead, okay. The monumental mausoleum in Paris that houses the remains of dozens of France's most honored luminaries from Voltaire to the Curies to André Malraux. Moliere's reputation evolved over time. As with the elevation of other literary heroes, Shakespeare and the invention of bardolatry, for example, such hero making is not the process of, not the product of a neutral process owed to innate greatness. I think I'm okay. I, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Great. The, I, I don't mind a little. Damn, but I can't see my page. The candidate for national hero status must possess qualities without which the nation could not fully articulate its unique characteristics, could not perform itself to itself. Moliere's hold on the French imaginary and the roots of his status as a figure of national veneration resides in the fact that he is believed to epitomize French attributes like intellectual rigor, unwitting masking of hypocrisy and excessive behavior. He voices a uniquely French form of drollness. Moreover, making national heroes of cultural figures is historically contingent. It happens over time and on multiple fronts in education, commentary, academic criticism, and popular culture. It is invariably political. John Rodden, author of The Politics of Literary Reputation, describes it as enmeshed in ideological beliefs and emergent from within concrete forms of social and institutional life. Through centuries-long entanglement of national characteristics, institutional valorization, and popular culture, Moliere has taken up residency in the lived experience of French people residing in that zone that might be called, after Norbert Elias, France's national habitus. In other words, feeling French. Moliere's journey toward becoming a national hero began in the 50 years after his death in 1673, with the trend to memor memorialize his personality by emphasizing his superior temperament. He was seen to possess a restrained or taciturn gravity, discerning common sense and humanitarian empathy. These qualities are far removed from the stereotypical notions about the frivolous, self-involved personality of actors, but they are wholly appropriate for budding figures of national esteem. By the early 1700s, his reputation as a deep thinker, a man of, quote, very serious attitude, is popularized. Although he was very agreeable in conversation when people pleased him, he spoke very little in company, recalls a letter from 1740, unless he finds himself among persons for whom he had particular esteem. This suggested to those who did not know him that he was a melancholy dreamer. But if he spoke little, he spoke well. Moliere's good sense and even disposition was the subject of biographical anecdotes. For example, there's a famous story about a dinner party where he gently dissuades his guest, guests from an alcohol-fueled plan to drown themselves collectively. He is also depicted as a man of empathy for those less fortunate. As told in another anecdote, 
involving a passing beggar to whom Moliere gives a valuable gold coin. When the beggar, thinking it must be a mistake, tries to return it, Moliere gives him yet another. In a vivid story about the last hours of his life, Moliere refuses to cancel the planned performance of Le, Le Malade Imaginaire, despite his obvious suffering. How could I do that, he asks of his colleagues. There are 50 poor workers who have nothing but their daily wages to survive. What will, we, what will they do if we don't play? As the 18th century wore on, his reputation as a humanitarian grew alongside a newer configuration of Moliere as a philosophe, an intellectual activist, according to one historian of his reputation. For Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire and the encyclopedist Jean-Francois Marmontel, elevating Moliere to the status of a philosopher involved crafting an image of him as a reluctant theater maker, a writer of great intellect who was forced to reduce himself to writing crowd pleasers and then endure the exhausting life of a theater actor and manager. A sage, a humanitarian, a philosophe is not quite yet a hero. For heroes, a society must invest ordinary men and women with special powers. After the mid-1700s, in a development that did much to undermine the divinity of monarchy and, by the way, pave the way to the revolution, a, mo a movement for the adoration of great men of France emerged. Through his quote, through this uh, quote, cult of great men, a phenomenon explored by Jean-Claude Barnet in his excellent book, Naissance du Panthéon, glorification was bestowed no longer on a king with divinely granted powers, but on men of extraordinary but secular merit, merit in the form of intellectual, military, or artistic genius. In this new paradigm, Moliere entered the revolution in the company of honored men of France and was valorized as a figure worthy of national rec recognition in a symbolic, if not a real, Pantheon de France. The effect of the revolution on Moliere's reputation can be seen in several notable developments, and I devoted an entire book to it, so I'll just give you a paragraph now. <laughs> These are remarkable for the extent to which they attempt to dis disassociate Moliere from the indelible realities of the historical moment in which he lived and wrote his plays. In iconography, pamphlets, journals, theatrical scenarios, and commentary, Moliere is written about as an opponent, an opponent of aristocracy. He becomes a revolutionary avant la lettre. Characters from his plays were adapted and deployed to critique the Ancien Regime. Reformulations of his biographical literature revised the historical facts of his relationship with Louis XIV and depicted him as an unwilling servant to a despot. In some of the most remarkable commentary from the revolutionary era, weaknesses in Moliere's plays from a literary perspective were viewed as a deliberate ploy to undermine the king as covert resistance to a despised benefactor. The result was an image of Moliere primed for France's future, not its past. In sum, the 18th century was significant for carving multiple facets of Moliere's iconic status. He is seen, on the one hand, as a genius apart from ordinary men. On the other, he is cast as an ordinary sans culotte of the revolution, a sage, a humanitarian, an intellectual, a revolutionary. And he takes his place in the French imaginary and is poised to become a tragic figure and a man of the people in the 19th century. On the intersection of the Rue Moliere and the Rue de Richelieu in Paris is a fountain featuring a statue of Moliere. Its size 
is impressive. Yet, because it's placed at the crossroads of two rather smaller streets and not featured in a prominent square where such monuments are typically found, the memorial is easily overlooked. But it should not be. It's an important symbol of a century that was passionate about Moliere to a remarkable degree. Its construction in 1844 marks the halfway point in a century of converging trends that, on the whole, secured Moliere's reputation as a unique genius, a hero for the reform of French politics and society, and an icon of cultural patrimony worthy of a central role in the education of a renewed nation. Authors of the Romantic movement in the first half of the 19th century played a decisive part in secure, securely establishing Moliere's place among the immortals of French literature by emphasizing his reputation as a suffering genius. According to Otis Fellows in his book, French Opinion of Moliere, he had at heart a sadness, wrote Jean-Charles Sainte-Beuve, one of 19th century most prolific literary critics. The novelist Stendhal similarly concluded that, quote, the greatest pur purveyor of laughter of the French classical age died a victim of melancholy. Although the myth of Moliere's solitary contemplative nature dates back to the 18th century, the Romantics transformed introspection into sadness and sadness into Moliere as a tragic figure a man prey to sublime melancholy. This is significant in terms of Moliere's national stature because melancholy was viewed as the manifestation of the true nature of genius and the basis of moral goodness. Whereas on the one hand, the revolutionaries grappled with Moliere's subservience to despotism that the conditions of his creative production demanded, the romantics, on the other hand, focused on the root of genius and simply dismissed such historical specificities. For Santabeuve, Moliere was not confined to his socio-political milieu. He was not branded, defined, nor diminished by it. He was shaped by it, but it did not limit him. This element of dehistoricizing Moliere is very specific to 19th century criticism, which rendered him timeless in the appeal of the essence of his enduring genius. In the tumultuous decades of the mid-19th century, the view that Moliere was, as Stendhal saw him, the painter par excellence of foibles, tics, and the illusions of the social opportunist gained greater meaning. Through the revolutions of 1830 and 1848, and the struggle for popular sovereignty they involved, Moliere came to be seen very specifically as a man of the people. Two plays from this period by Georges Sand, Le Roi Attend and Moliere from 1848 and 1851, exemplify this conception of Moliere as a modern people's poet, connecting him visually and figuratively with the worker's audience of April 1848. This is according to Gretchen Smith, who studied these plays in depth. If in the 1840s, saint beuve could write of the triste, the sad, Moliere, 20 years later, after the upheavals of the mid-century, the renowned critic argued that Moliere's legacy was above all to teach the French to abhor hypocrisy, fanaticism, and intolerance. In the 1870s, France's defeat in the Franco-Prussian War and the civil horrors of the Paris Commune initiated a crisis in French identity. Its resolution demanded explicit articulation of French heritage and values. In this context, teaching Moliere's plays became a foundation in a reformed educational movement. Ralph Albanez has written extensively about Moliere in the educational reforms of the Third Republic. He writes that through Moliere's incorporation into a nationalized school curriculum, 
he became more and more the object of national glory and the epitome of France's cultural heritage. Nothing typifies this entry into national glory so concretely as yet another phenomenon of Moliere's 19th century reputation, research. The first serious archival-based research into Moliere's life was accomplished in 1821 uh, by Louis Buffara, who published his Dissertation sur Poquelin Moliere. This was followed by re-editions of his plays and more biographies. The height of the research movement was the periodical Le Moliériste, published uh, from 1879 to 1889. This monthly journal was devoted to the discussion of any shred of information or documentation or artifact related to Moliere. While today the Moliereist movement is seen as excessively narrow and more concerned with antiquarian minutiae than historical analysis and scope, this journal, coupled with more than a century of significant scientific research into Moliere's life and how he wrote his plays, secured Moliere's status as French national treasure as never before. The 19th century painted Moliere as a melancholy genius, man of the people, timeless and universal, yet an anchor of education in a revived French nation. The Moliere that evolved in the 20th century was, by contrast, a distinctly more tangible presence. This was due to two important innovations. A modernist reform movement in French theater and the advent of film. In the 20th century, Moliere becomes to be viewed, comes to be viewed first and foremost, finally, as a theater maker. And this to a degree that had not been so since his lifetime. Granting him the status of man of the theater, and that's the title of Rene Bray's groundbreaking 1954 study, shifted his repute from that of a chiefly literary appreciation and placed it squarely within an earthbound metier, actor, playwright, producer. Embracing Moliere as a theatrical artist reflected the impact of modernism with its iconoclastic attitude towards the artistic values of the past. Moliere's plays, his life, and the practicalities of his livelihood, now seen through the lens of theater making, made for a new kind of anti-genius, the beauty of the working artist. Proof of Moliere's changed status can be found in the work of the 20th century's premier theater reformer, Jacques Copeau, who founded the Théâtre Vieux Colombier in 1913 and spent the World War I years with his company in New York City. Copeau favored Moliere among all the authors of the same era, and he used Moliere's works to create innovation in acting and scenography. Contrary to the fashion of celebrating Moliere's great five-act comedies like Tartuffe and Misanthrope, Coupeau preferred the shorter, farcical comedies like L'Amour Médecin and Les Fourberies de Scapin. Coupeau championed these plays, sensing perhaps that a modernizing France, throwing off the artistic values of the past, would now be open to embracing a version of her national hero that was forged not by marble monuments, antiquarian historians, and literary analysis, but by those plays that had been considered Moliere's least consequential output. When Capot and later André Barsac, Louis Jouvet, Jean-Louis Barrault and others uh, brought French theater to the United States on missions of cultural diplomacy. They frequently featured Moliere's plays, thus asserting his significance in the transactional economy of cultural exchange. The research that was so passionately undertaken by the Moliereist movement in the 19th century yielded details about his life that fed another notable phenomenon of Moliere's image making in the 20th century. Cinematic depiction. 
Moliere is not a favored subject for biographical films. The details of his life still remain too elusive. Yet films were made, and probably none more essential to the question of Moliere as national hero than the film Moliere by the theater director Ariane Mnuchin. The film premiered in 1978 as France's entrance at the Cannes Film Festival. It was shown in July that year at the Avignon Theater Festival and then opened nationally in September. Criticism of the film was mostly negative, at best mixed, at times brutal. A common criticism revolved around what Mnuchin chose to include or exclude about the life of Moliere. Mnuchkin's approach to her subject happened to be the passion of her life, the theatrical collective. The film dwells on Moliere's childhood and the 13 years his company spent touring the provinces. His Parisian years occupy less than a third of the film, and the film largely deals with Moliere before he ever wrote his first play. In other words, the film is not about the unique genius of Moliere, it is a fictionalized depiction of theater lives as they were lived and sometimes still are in deeply intense, difficult personal professional alliances. For critics, this focus on collective creation negated Moliere as a singular genius. Moliere is at the heart of our heritage, wrote the, criti uh, wrote the critic Pierre Billard. He is without a doubt the greatest incarnation of French distinction. He has endured across the ages, performed more and more with each century. He is author number one for our theater troops. Specialists dissect his works and people burst with laughing, laughter. Munushkin refuses to extol the genius of Moliere, Biard charged in 1978, because the idea of a great man is felt today to be something ridiculous or insulting. Perhaps the 20th century's most innovative contribution to the shape of Moliere's reputation, making him a man of the theater, could not coexist comfortably with the image of genius uh, as genius of French literature. The homme de théâtre, the man of the theater, is too faulty, too real. The 2007 film Moliere by Laurent Tirard is interesting from this perspective because it tries to depict both the theater maker and the nascent literary genius. It relies on this fictional premise. It shows Moliere in 1644 as a somewhat sullen, would-be actor, hopeful tragedian. Not yet an author, he is plunged into a situation that brings him in contact with extravagant characters and humorous events. Uh, these offer him real-life inspirations for the characters and events that will eventually fill his plays. The premise has been compared to that of Shakespeare in Love, with good reason. Both, are films, both of these films are origin myths. They suggest that literary genius emerges from experience, but only after one leaves behind the dirty business of theater making. Whereas Mnuchkin's film is devoted to the story of an everyday actor and manager, Jean-Baptiste Poquelin, who becomes the playwright Moliere. Tirard's film is the story of the playwright Moliere, shown in the guise of a prior incubating Jean-Baptiste Poquelin. In this sense, Tirard's film never really strays from the image of Moliere as a singular genius inspired by uniquely French experiences. There is a 1997 film by theater luminary Robert Wilson with a text written by the German postmodern playwright Heiner Müller called La, La Mort de Molière, The Death of Molière. In the opening moments of the film, we hear a recitation in a voiceover. This is a poem about Molière. The poem watches Molière dying. The poem watches a dying man at work who is called Moliere. 
this is a poem about Moliere. There is perhaps some value in thinking about cultural heroes as a kind of poem, a national poem, an anthem. The poetry of Moliere as national hero is certainly present in this passage from a 2019 book by the French actor Francis Huster entitled, appropriately enough, Moliere, mon Dieu. The petition in this book was addressed to President Macron and makes a plea to install Moliere in the pan Pantheon. See if you can hear the music of this anthem, which comes through even in my translation of the French. Because Moliere has honored France by offering it four centuries of incomparable moments of liberating laughter, humanistic courage, and pure human tenderness, which have become the emblems of the soul of our republic, because French is the language of Moliere, because throughout the entire world his works continue to be the image of what is most striking about Moliere, it's about France, its boldness and love of truth, I want in the name of millions from all nations across all continents who for four centuries have loved us and served us by the thousands of words of this text to officially open the page on which will be inscribed to finally render him justice, the entrance of Moliere into the Pantheon on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of his birth, the 15th January, 2022. There actually is not a period in that entire thing in French. And, <laughs> and I tried to capture it using any kind of punctuation I could. But I think the only way to read it is let it go. Okay. <laughs> uh, to my knowledge, France at this point is still not intending to translate Moliere's uh, remains, if they are Moliere's remains, from the cemetery Père Lachaise to the Pantheon. Maybe Felicia knows better, but that's the latest news I have. The national poem that is Moliere has been crafted over centuries. Like other poems come anthem, anthems, his is complex, metaphorical, symbolic, suggestive, and ultimately the product of the interpretation of each one of its readers. Thank you. <laughs>